All right, let's go ahead and pray in. Father God, we just thank you for this day, Lord. Just thank you for this gathering. Um, thank you for the way you tied us together. And uh, just the, the way we want to serve you. Thank you for the hearts in this room, Lord. Thank you for their just desire to be used by you to help others get peace and healing. Uh, Lord, just um, pray over today's teaching and conversation. Just bless it. Pray that it's rich, Lord, and that uh, everything that we teach is of you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we're just going to basically jump right into it. Yes, Jeff? What? You want to film us? No, it's, it's got a thing where you it'll switch around. So oh, it's sorry. Nice. Okay. Thanks for interrupting. I'm scared of sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, okay, if you can stop it again. Let's go ahead and pray. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. No, um, we're going to start out with another case study today. Yes. Oh, no, yeah, Q&A. That's right. All right. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I think the answers. Yeah, no, I definitely don't. No, I meant them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did they, um, we're off to a great start. Um, any questions at all about anything from yesterday? Anything at all? Joy has a question. Joy. Okay, when you say those things, what are you referring to? Well, Martin said, has anybody ever experienced manifestations of demonic activity? Whatever your question was that I said, um, you know, getting sick, you're rolling in the gut, mm -hmm. um, rolling your head back, sweating, hyperventilating, you know, pass, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I'm wondering if that was not. Yes. 
talk about that because you had an experience that was really important that there was a ministry going on where there was a manifestation of the demonic not in joy's ministry group but in another ministry group going on and again we never do ministry alone right and so one person was able to get up and go and get help and that's what they did is they went and they got joy and they were able to come in and to really pray through that and so yeah yeah right somewhere else so did that answer your question yeah, I just was confused whether there truly are crazy demonic manifestations. Yes, there I'm are. Not the stress reaction. Mm -hmm. I get stress no, 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 no. I'm saying, I'm saying that, I'm saying that there can be a react. We can see something physically manifesting in somebody that can be a reaction to severe anxiety, and it could be a reaction to the demonic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I just, I'm just saying. Yeah, what we really have to do is just to go in on it. Go in on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, follow the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> but also to ensure the safety of the, of the group. Yeah. Because I've had oh, yeah. 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 where the demonic would have been angry. And I mean, he was getting so angry that, you know, we wanted to continue, but we, we excused the rest of the group so that we, you know, because we were afraid he was going. Mm. You know, but uh, you know, you've got to think of the safety of the group as well without putting it on to the person that you're, you're trying to help. Mm. You know. Yeah, just face the Yeah. All right, what other questions? I had kind of a ministry philosophy question. Um, in yesterday's scenario, there were six men that were mentioned and all a similar situation of feeling like she was had inappropriate authority and shame and guilt from allowing them to, you know, kind of rule what she was doing and that she sought uh, positive affirmations from them because she was doing what they wanted her to do. Would you not? Would you not want to get rid of or go through um, guide them through all six of those to because they're similar or would you? recognize one of them and kind of guide them through forgiving the mom because of that and then she's got that in her head that she can go back and do that by herself in case she don't finish ministry that night or would you get the big chunk of things that are similar done so that there's a heavier weight taken off of her shoulders I, I just think that's an excellent question yeah. because because it's yes Yes, <laughs> 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 and, and you just continue to grow. Look at you. Because <laughs> you know that's, well, <laughs> that's why we come under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Because yeah. because again, it's what is what is she ready for? Okay, you know. And so, in some ways, this is like kind of the Monday morning quarterbacking. Mm. However. That can actually be a useful tool, right? To learn a lot from the, from the from what just happened, you know. So, so the, that is why when we ask questions or we kind of explore, you know, God will just show you because their their responses back to you will help you to know. Okay, this yeah, this is where we go. This is what we do. It kind of goes back to what I was saying last time about reading the room spiritually. And so you, you want you want to have you don't want to be locked into like well every time I'm going to do this mm -hmm. you know right I always just say I just want to have all my tools ready for the Holy Spirit you know whatever that is so that's my my thought would be I have these in mind and whatever because in some situations maybe God does lead you through talking to you know, over each one of them maybe not but so in each situation just be fluid enough to like what do you want me to do today God in this situation or maybe in the interest of So Debbie, that's true. That can happen at soul time. However, there's times in which during the ministry we break a soul tie and do a cleansing prayer. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why the answer is yes. 
and no. <laughs> because because it cannot be all things. So it is really it is really where God directs you to, and and to be sensitive to what's actually happening. You know, it is about not being so much here but being here. It, right. Every time that you come from here with that and you get out of here, then then you're gonna see it. It's gonna just be happening. So, um, what else? Other questions? Yeah. What other, what other questions? Yeah. yeah. It sounds like if we come back to, you know, there is no exact formula, but it sounds like everything you did was great. Yeah. The, I guess I'm, I'm going to give you some, like, top-down, like, counsel, I guess, on that. Whatever I tell people about when it comes to, like, spiritual warfare is that you always got to remember that we fight from a position of victory, not for victory. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, gosh, I hope God wins it, but he's already won. So we always we always we take authority, just like Marsha was saying, and so it's easy to kind of you know be over, be overwhelmed initially. But as you said, just as you've done, God's in control here, you know, and He you have no right to be here, you know. So out, you know, it doesn't have to be anything hugely dramatic or loud or whatever. It just it's just mm -hmm. like when a cop blows you over, you just have to scream really. It's like okay, I'm, I'm here, you know, whatever. And so I just remember. This is the last thing I'll say. Is I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I was in a small group. There's a gal that talked about her. And she's a college age student. She'd been to Haiti and seen all kinds of voodoo and stuff. There's some shit stuff there. And she said, she was describing the scene where there was like, just like that, but even worse, you know. And she said, uh, I was like, as a young Christian, like, oh, I'd be so terrified if that happened. And she goes, she goes, oh no, she goes, Jesus scares the pants off the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I was like, and that was it. I had my philosophy on spiritual work. I'm like, oh yeah, we totally. We're on Jesus' side. <laughs> that's, it. that's my philosophy. There's a visual cast. I know, right? <laughs> but it's interesting that you said that you weren't scared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want I just that's where you started was it was uncomfortable, it was unusual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what you spoke in was that you were not scared. And that is because you, you we fight from a position of victory. And because you are under God's authority when you do ministry. No question. So so we just don't have to be worried or afraid. Um, I mean, Sheila and I have been in ministry, and all of a sudden, I'll, like, like she'll be talking to the seeker, and all of a sudden, I'll just, I'll just sit in the back and say, Jesus. I mean, I'm just like, I just start chanting the name of Jesus, literally. You know, or she'll lead them through prayer and use the name of Jesus often. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Um, Jesus Christ. I mean, we just speak it over mm -hmm. and over and over again, and there is a settling mm -hmm. that can happen yeah. when, that, when we do that. And I coach Nancy, like just with, especially because we kind of were in the pair, because there was just a lot going on with them throughout the entire of, but of the speaking, and they, even if she's whispering at God, like you know, quietly. Um, but I think, you know, when you say that I was, I said I wasn't scared, I remember a time when I did my own ministry with you guys, and I came into that, I was very, I used to be very scared because, um, I 
can talk after class. Sure. One, we'll do one more quick question. Uh, anybody else?
he would spend a lot of time with me and my sisters. And uh, he would usually just come home, eat his dinner, and you know, plop down in the recliner and drink a beer. And stuff was his evening. <coughs> um, at times he would engage us, but usually those times were not good. Um, he ended up a pretty bad temper, uh, but that was only like when he drank too much. Um, when he did, I usually, I usually had the worst of it. Um, he usually would yell at my sisters or get physical with them. Um, at first, when I was younger, he would just yell at me, nothing, nothing physical. Um, it would always start simple enough, you know, like this is one, it was almost like an entry point to how he would talk to me. It would always be a simple question, but I knew it was his ramp up. Like he'd be like, did you leave the garage door open? And, or uh, did you think mom were going to be last night? Because I know you're a little late. She's kind of worried. And I, as soon as I would hear that, I knew what's about to happen. It was just like a, it was like he's got a whole thing ready for me. And this was just laid, this was like the intro. You know, this was about to happen. Um, and then he was just, within a few minutes, he was in like full throttle, like veins popping out of his head and everything. Like when I was younger, man, it was terrifying. I would just like freeze. I, I was, he was blasting me to tatters, man. It was like one of one of his favorite sayings during this tirade was, "I wish you were never born." That's how frustrated he was with me. And it was crazy coming from a guy who's barely said a word just to see him in this state. You know? I just remember thinking, what could I have possibly done? to make you this mm -hmm. agitated, you know? Well, how, how can you hate me this much when you barely even know me, you know? Um, when this was happening, I knew he was drunk, so I would just do my best to blow it off. The next day, he was back to normal. None of us, including him, would even mention anything. Um, my parents ended up getting divorced when I was 12. I don't remember being too emotional about it. Uh, my sisters and I stayed living with my mom. We'd visit Dad on a fairly regular basis. He was always really tired whenever we were over, like usual. Um, he just ended up watching TV, and we usually didn't talk too much. Um, as time went on, his violent outbursts became less frequent. You know, as he got older, I don't know if he was an old or what, but, or if it was the fact that we were all getting older, but they still happened. Um, the last one he had was when I was 17. I remember it so well. Um, because he was like the last time he did it, because he was, I was older and I was kind of done with it. You know, I wasn't, I was just, I just was tired of this, you know. <clears throat> and I was older, and so I was like, I just kind of can kind of handle myself, I guess. And he started in on me again. It was like, he was kind of like, it was a very much a bullying type thing. And so he was sitting at his desk, and he turned around and he started in on me. And it was very interesting because my reaction was entirely different than it was when I was younger, you know, because it was just like, I just got very agitated by the fact that he was doing this again, because it was like, well, you know, he can't do this anymore. And so he was sitting at his desk, and I remember I moved over toward him, where usually I would have been like, backing off, and I just instinctively moved over toward him, and I was like, leaning over, because he was huge, he was a lot bigger than me, he was a big dude. And he was like, so I was, I was leaning over him, Kind of a menacing fashion, and I was like pointing at him, you know, like this, and and I don't, and I honestly don't know if he actually did this or if it was just like an emotional reaction, but it was almost like he was like, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right kind of thing. You know? It was like immediate. It didn't even take that long. And I remember thinking, oh, I should have done this years ago. I mean, you know, <laughs> would have saved me a lot of a lot of you know trauma. You know, so it was, and so it was the first time I ever ever talked back to him. And that was the last one that ever happened. Um, I don't even remember what I said or anything else. I just remember the, the attitude toward it, you know. And so he kind of just shrunk and never fought for me. It was just a huge event, you know. Um, oh, circling back, something else I should probably mention. When I was younger, right after um, my parents got divorced, I went through this very, again, and maybe it's strange, maybe it's not. But I was very attached to my mom. I couldn't, I didn't want to let her out of my sight. You know, I became very paranoid. So like overnight, I just had this instinct. And so wherever she, I, wherever she went, I mean, you know, where she was going, when she was going to get back. And this was like in the 70s. So I was like, we didn't have cell phones or trackers and stuff. We just had to kind of wait. You know? And so I just had to know where she's at. I became very panicky if she was late, if she didn't let me know where she was at. It was very visceral. 
Um, so anyway, and she at first she kind of played into it like it's gonna be okay. She played one, then she's kind of sort of getting like, more annoyed by it generally. Um, when my father saw this, this kind of way I was acting, instead of putting my mind at ease or you know when he was seeing that I was scared, he didn't try to comfort me. He used to belittle me for being scared. And so that I was kind of weak, you know. So um, as I'm preparing for this ministry, I'm talking about it. Um, it's given me a real chance to reflect when I think about how I was treated by my parents in general. And I find myself getting really angry about it. I, I really don't have a relationship with my father at all anymore. Uh, he's reached out, especially now that he's become a grandparent, but I haven't really reciprocated. I mean, I don't want him around my kids. I know what he can do. He was a bad dad. You know? He was either unengaged entirely or raging, or raging at me. It was the two speeds he had. Not at all, or anger, you know. Um, <clears throat> so where do I leave off? I'm sorry, I'm jumping around so much. Let me get back to, let me, let me jump into high school. Um, I started dating when I was in high school. Most of my relationships were really intense, but they usually wouldn't last for more than a few months. Um, that was pretty much the pattern like through college. Uh, I met my first wife on a blind date right after I graduated college. Um, we related to each other because we both had really bad childhoods. We moved in together right after we started dating. It was pretty good for a while, but I mean, we were mostly homebodies. We eventually got married. I started the police academy shortly after, shortly after that. We were married. I had always wanted to be on the force. Um, after a few months, we just started fighting quite a bit. And sometimes it got physical. We decided to just keep going, trying to make it work. We ended up getting divorced after about three years. Um, I was working as a police officer. That was going pretty well. I was kind of known for more of, let's say, aggressive approach in my work, you know. Um, second wife, I met my second wife uh, through a friend. We dated for about six months and then got married. Um, we got pregnant right away. We decided that she would uh, stay at home and we ended up having two more kids eventually. Um, things were always rough between us. Again, it just seems like we were always fighting. Raising three kids on one income creates a lot of tension. You know. I've been married to my second wife for about, uh, for now for about eight years. So what basically brought me here was I'm separated from my wife now. Um, I moved out about three months ago. Um, I seem to keep repeating all these cycles, especially as I tell my story, it sounds very obvious, you know. Nothing ever changes, and this is where my best thinking has got me. It's just like everything is falling down around me again, and I don't know what to do. Okay, so we'll stop there. So, what would you, where would you go if you were the ministry leader? What would you ask? Who do you want to forgive first? Who do you want to forgive first? Okay, what else?
think I'd ask him about his relationship with Jesus. Yeah. What's his, where's, where's his spiritual background? Yeah. Okay. Also the curses that were spoken over him and he found them and he Uh-huh. Yeah.
So, um, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this time. I just thank you, Lord, that this is an appointed time for your son, Alan. That you brought him here today, Lord, to sit before you, to sit before his Heavenly Father. And Lord, as he uh, prays through his uh, forgiveness with his Father, Lord, I just pray that you just come and wrap your loving arms around him. Lord, I just pray uh, that he just comes under your authority. <clears throat> and that if there's any enemy that may be trying to uh, build walls or, or hold back any memories, Lord, that that just be bound in the name of Jesus. And Lord, that, that his memories are just opened up. And he knows that you are here to comfort him and to walk through this time with him. He's in a safe place. Sitting in Choose to forgive for not being a good leader of our family. I choose to forgive for not being a good example of what a uh, a good father was like. For for I forgive him for like all the work I had to do to figure out what a good father was. He didn't do anything to help me out with that. taught me all the wrong things. You know, I, just, I, forget, I choose to forgive him for what, how that's impacted the way I live my life. Mm -hmm. So it might be helpful to choose to forgive him for, for not modeling being good. Uh, I choose to forgive him for not modeling what, what, a, father should, what a father should be. Yeah. Yeah. That's Choosing to forgive him for demonstrating aggression. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I choose to forgive him for demonstrating aggression as a way to communicate and get what you want. And what about for raging? Rage. I choose to forgive him for raging. <clears throat> and um, were there any words that he spoke over you that you want to choose to forgive? Um, yeah, I mean, I choose to forgive him for. Saying um, I, he, that he wished I'd never been born. And yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. To choose to forgive him for not being a, a good dad. And, yeah, choose to forgive him for not being a good dad. Jeez. Okay, so as he's gone through forgiveness, um, what would you do next? That was that part. Relinquish rights associated with the things that you forgave. Okay. Explore judgments that he's made about his dad. Explore judgments that he's made about his dad. Yeah. yeah. I'm um, asking um, along the lines of what did who did he see as a good example of a father? Mm. Who did he see as an example of a father? Okay. Vows. Vows. Explore if he made any vows. Okay. Curses. Or cur 
purses. Open purses. Okay, are there any that you, you see that, and what were those, what would those be? There was fears, there was condemnation, there was murders, there was resentment, secret of spirit, and possibly spirit of slavery. Those are more companies. What was the last one? Slavery. Slavery. Oh. Okay. All right. What about others? So exploring the, um, the comment, I wish you'd ever worn, and really understanding his birth story is what I'm hearing you say. What is, yeah. What he really thought, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sometimes that can cause an awful lot of aggression that people can't ever release. Sure. I have no follow the script, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's it's the script. Script. I'm sorry. You gotta learn to go with the flow, people. It's it's it makes it very Here we go. <laughs> 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 
so, I mean, at the end of the day, I feel pretty relieved. I can't believe, as we keep digging into this stuff, this was just who I saw who I was, and I didn't lose other stuff. Um, I feel satisfied, because I'm starting to understand how this all kind of comes together. Um, and for being very honest, as we kind of dig this stuff up, I feel a little bit angry. Okay, so can you talk to me about that? Like, what is it about the anger? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, like, the responsibility of my parents, you know? I mean, I'm a parent now, and I can look back and see how impactful this was on me, how much I've overcome this, you know? And I, I would never treat my kids that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really glad God's giving you that revelation and, and to see how all of this is starting to tie together. You know, God asks us to stand in the moment of forgiveness, and that really is, is a hard thing to do. <clears throat> and if I remember right, you mentioned that, you know, sometimes you yell at your kids. And when that happens, when you're yelling at your kids, how does that make you feel? Um, I feel awful. I feel very broken. I need to, I need to qualify. I might be yelling at my kids to pick up their shoes, but it makes me feel the worst. It's me at my worst. Mm. Do you think that that kind of triggers those feelings of worthlessness that you talked about? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hate it. It's, now, honestly, I can't even see this coming out. I can see this coming out my youngest son. He, oh, he also has these outbursts. He moves from zero to rage in a split second, and then back to normal. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you about something. Do you, do you think it's possible that you may have made a vow that you would, you know, something like, you know, I, I would never be like my father. Oh, well, without a doubt, I'm sure I made that vow plenty of times. And given all the hatred I had from growing up, I made I made a conscious effort not to be like him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do you remember that vow teaching and, and what the issue is about making the vow? I mean, why is that not a not a good thing? It doesn't it become like a self fulfilling prophecy. Right, right, exactly. And I understand why you made it. I mean, you know, as a kid, sometimes we. We make things to help protect ourselves, or we feel like that that's going to be a way to to distance ourselves from, uh, especially when we're so emotionally uh, being hurt. And given the number of rage uh, experiences that you have with your father, I mean, I, I you know it makes sense that that a kid would say that. The thing is, is that when you make that vow, is it possible that you also made a judgment about your dad? Oh yeah, he was an awful dad. I'm sure he did. Yeah. So. So earlier when you were forgiving your dad and um, <clears throat> there was a kind of an unwillingness or a hesitation about uh, forgiving him for his anger or rage towards you, did you see how that unforgiveness now could be tied to a vow or a judgment that you made and uh, against him, against your dad? And is it possible that that judgment may be coming back on yourself when you yell at your kid or you know that you then start judging yourself? Well, yeah, against I, that standard. I can totally see that. So, would you like to break that vow and break that judgment? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, so I think it might be helpful first to go ahead and forgive your dad. Mm -hmm. Again, for the you know now that you have that understanding, sometimes it can be helpful then to really choose to forgive him mm -hmm. and to really uh, forgive him for the you know, those deep hurts. Mm -hmm. now, the way you hurt your heart mm -hmm. and the way you do that. So, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I choose to forgive my dad. I choose to forgive my dad for um, just you know, all the, the the way he hurt me, the way he just ne he neglected his responsibilities, the way he. He came at it, he came at me like a, like as a as a as someone who's not a loving and kind father. I choose to forgive him for that. It might be helpful to choose to forgive him for scaring me. Mm, yeah. Um, I choose to forgive him for scaring me. Yeah. For making me feel like he was um, wanting to just get rid of you. Mm. Yeah, I choose to forgive him for making me feel like he wanted to be rid of me. So Lord, I 
I choose to forgive my dad. Or I, sorry, Lord, I choose, uh, I ask you to forgive me for making the vow. Lord, I ask you to forgive me for making the vow. Uh, what vow did you make? Lord, I would never be anything like my dad. Yeah. And I renounce that, that vow in the name of Jesus. I renounce that vow in the name of Jesus. It no longer has a part of me. It no longer has a part of me. And Lord, please give me a healthy perspective. Lord, give me a healthy perspective. And Lord, forgive me for making the bitter root judgment. Lord, forgive me for making the bitter root judgment. That my dad was a bad parent or a bad person. That my dad was a bad parent or a bad person. And I break this judgment. I break this judgment. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I pray that you break any judgment. And I pray that you break any judgment. That I brought upon myself. That I brought upon myself. a little bit about, you know, traumatic events in our lives often lead us to make vows or just like the one you just broke and and based on the way your father spoke over you and intimidated you, uh, are there other vows that you may have made? Oh yeah, I mean, I've probably made a ton of vows. It becomes a measure of how I'm doing as a father. I don't want, I don't want this hanging over Okay, so here's where Sheila would lead Alan through breaking a ton of vows. Um, but in the interest of time, we're not going to go through each one. Imagine that we've just finished breaking them, however, where would you go next? Just finished breaking all of the vows that you can really think of. Prayer. Prayer. You need to wrap up. Yeah, that seems to be what's happening, definitely. So, 
Would you like to walk through breaking that generational curse? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, so I'm just going to walk you through that prayer as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, Lord, I confess. Lord, I confess. The generational sin. The generational sin. Of. Of rage. Yeah. yeah. And I ask you to forgive. And I ask your forgiveness. I ask for forgiveness. And I renounce the generational sin. And I renounce the generational sin. And break it for my children. And break it for my children. And my children's children. And my children's children. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It no longer has any power over me. And it no longer has power over me. Yeah, or my family. Or my family. And Lord, I choose to. Lord, I choose to. Um, have you reparent. Have you reparent. Right. To teach me how to be a father. Mm -hmm. To teach me how to be a father. So thank you, Lord, for breaking that generational curse in the name of Jesus um, and becoming Yaman's parent, being his father, and him seeing you as his dad that loves him, that treasures him, that calls him precious. So Alan, I just want to just have you recognize for a minute that that's just such a big thing that you just did. I mean, that was like a real act. You know, to stand in that moment mm -hmm. and to say, you know, I know who's the authority in my life. Right? And I'm going to do that not just for me, but I'm going to do that for my kids and for my grandkids. Yeah. That is an act of the love of your father. Yeah, yeah that's huge. I mean, that's probably one of the best things I can do for him. I mean, given how it's impacted my life, it will save me a lot of problems. Yeah. Right, it is huge. So what can you talk to me a little bit about what, what are the responsibilities that God gives you as a, as a dad, as a father? Uh, you know, like love, protection, provision, being a spiritual leader of your family, uh, to set an example of what a father and husband should look like, uh, to give them identity, and to give them value. Well, it sounds like you have a really great relationship. So as we've been talking about your father and about how did he make you feel, I mean, so when we were talking about your father, I'm sorry, how did that make you feel? Um, fearful, disoriented, worthless. Yeah. Does it make you feel unloved? Oh yeah, without a question. I feel pushed aside as like vapor, you know? Uh -huh. I was nothing to him. Uh -huh. Would it be safe to say that you felt abandoned as a kid? Oh, totally, yeah. He never seemed to sign on to be a dad. I never considered backing me up. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing you talk about is not having any value. That, that he, in fact, wished you didn't even exist. Oh, yeah. That's definitely fair. He was not there for me, not at any support. Um, yeah, there's definitely not an attachment there. Yeah. So, Alan, do you think it might be helpful to forgive him for abandoning you? Yeah. I mean, I never, I never realized that as what I was feeling. That is exactly it. You know? um, Lord, I just choose to forgive my dad for abandoning me. Yeah, yeah. And so, Alan, while you're in this place, and I, I just want you to kind of just stay right there, I want you to, to, I want to talk to you about the enemy and the way that he finds vulnerable spots in our background. So, tell me if this resonates with you. What would you think about renouncing the spirit? Okay, we're going to stop there. The end. So, um, we'll just open it up for you guys. Um, she would walk him through, at this point she would walk him through uh, renouncing the spirit of abandonment, and then there could be a variety of places that they could go next. But what, um, was there anything that you saw that was surprising to you or was, um, uh, new to you. I never thought of abandonment as a spirit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is one, for real. And it is, um, um, I mean, that is, a, that is a demonic spirit that can make us um, it just, it can weave through our lives. It, so it starts to affect your belief system. You know, you start to believe that 
um, those that I love are going to leave me. Or that something's going to happen to them. Yes. And so you start to live in a phase of fear, which is not of the Lord. Mm -hmm. that, that was, that's very insidious and follow you all the way through. In terms of relationships, in terms of, you know, husband wife, in terms of uh, your, your kids and everything. Yeah, because sometimes when they're, especially when they're forgiving, and they kind of get in that that connection. I mean, where that those memories are coming back, and the and so, so because sometimes you'll hear them, uh, they're they're talking about the facts or the events, and so sometimes a good question might be, uh, uh, or any feeling, you know, the way he made you feel. Yeah, and so then they can sometimes connect with how they're. The, the feelings that they had when they're they're seeing the the event it you know for making me feel scared for making me feel and so sometimes that prompting can help them to start getting into the <coughs> emotions and then sometimes also then that question of words that they might have spoken the things that they the, the, the things that the hurtful things that they said is another way of putting that and boy that can open up a floodgate of then for us to start listening for of curses or you know just whatever those things might have been. So question um, when it's discerning the spirits um, it indicates a judgment of very central agents for their moral influence. So it could be a good or a bad spirit, are you looking for feeling words to kind of identify what those spirits might be? Like, you went back to him and he said that he was angry. So you address that, and then as a judgment, and then as a bad word, he spoke over himself, that sort of thing. So you're, I'm, I guess I'm just asking if, if feeling words more identify a spirit than letting That's a great question. I don't know that I've ever thought about it in terms of uh, that feelings help you to discern the spirit that you may be dealing with. Well, the, is that, words, is he, the words that he's saying to describe the feeling is kind of telling you what spirit mm -hmm. is with him at that moment. I think you can look at emotions, but I like, to my mind, I look more toward actions. Mm -hmm. like, what are you doing okay. that indicate? I think that's a more um, direct way, because I'm, I'm big on actions speak louder than words a lot of times, so it's like, if you see that this guy
guys got a lot of um, rage in him about because like for me this guy would ask him like do you do you get into like road rage or things like that? Is, is this a pattern in your life where it's like a real theme in terms of like a spirit of anger you know um, because you, you've already got the full indications of it you want to see is this something that's pervasive like have you ever been fired from your job I, I like I, I've got had guys like this where I got fired from I got kicked out of the Navy because I punched somebody you know I got you know I got arrested this number of times because I got in fights or whatever well those are all actions that you've got you've got an issue with anger you got a spirit of anger in your life. so wait before the fall if I can have because I want to respond to this so so our soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And sometimes one of those is more prevalent for us, okay. right? And so if you are, uh, if, if you are under some sort of influence by the demonic, it is likely going to play out in your mind, your will, and your emotions. And so depending on how I talk to you, there may be clues related to that. So what he just talked about was action. So that is how, how demonic can play out, probably with our will. Mm -hmm. Maybe even some, maybe some emotions behind that. But, but so I don't know that it's necessarily that we hear the, the emotional words to discern the spirit, because I would tell you that you really want to discern the spirit from the Holy Spirit. But if you are sensing God, if you are sensing God pressing upon you, that there may be a spirit of abandonment, then you sure can hear some words that would be helpful in um, repeating back to him. So I am just going to go ahead and say that the thing where we went off script, not to belabor that, but where we went off script was that Alan uh, was supposed to say, um, yeah, I'll choose, I can forgive him for, uh, for, not for, for not demodeling and being a good dad, but there's no way I'm forgiving him for raging, those rages. I'm not forgiving him for that. And, um, so the reason why I bring that up is because when we have somebody say, I'm not forgiving him for blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, our tendency may want to go right in on that, talk about how important it is to forgive, and what God says about forgiveness, and all that. And what she looks prepared to do was to let it go. <laughs> Which I did. And here you are. <laughs> oh my gosh. Did you write it? Because I didn't write that. Yes, we did. You wrote it. Did I really? it was, you spoke it. And I typed it while you spoke it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's really good, Jer. Yeah. I was saying, oh, yeah, this is how we're going to do it. I'm sorry I ruined your big moment. I just thought, uh, you know. No, it's not. But, but, I, but the reason why I wanted to go back and bring it up is because when people refuse, the, the, he's remember. forgiving, 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 but I am not forgiving him for raging at my dad. And we've already, I mean, for him raging at me. And we've already heard that he tends to blow up a little bit at his kids. And so she's already started to got some clues, which you guys heard too, that this may be a generational thing, that he's probably made a judgment against his father. So if he's made a judgment against his father of being a bad dad, then when he says, no, I'm not going to forgive him for that, that's probably a losing battle to try to force somebody or convince somebody yeah. to convince somebody because that judgment is such a stronghold. It was such a stronghold for him that to try to go in on that would be difficult. So it's like, the what do they do? What, at the end of a movie, they show you the outtakes and yeah. what the other, the alternate endings. This would be the alternate, the, the, the alternate scripts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whenever you, as a general rule for that, whenever you get like a hard, I'm not going to do that, it usually becomes a forgiveness or maybe a relinquishment. When you have a, I'm not doing that, best piece of advice is go around it for now. You know, it's like using somebody's energy and you just let them blow past. I was, I was thinking like, like in bullfights, when they just let the bull go out, it's like, go right by him, that's what you're gonna do. You know? Now, you then continue on with whatever you're doing, and you still build, you're building a relationship with that person, and you're getting yeses, you're getting, okay, well, do you wanna forgive him for whatever? Okay, yes, you know, then I'm gonna keep going, you get that kind of momentum going, you get them living that spot of forgiveness, right? 
And then I usually will at least once circle back around and then I'll just go, all right, just one second, I'm gonna visit. We started out with a few down to those ranges. And there's a good chance that at that point their heart's soften, they're starting to feel oh, this is what it's like to forgive. And your your chance of getting that again, I wouldn't go more than once, you don't want to belabor it because then they're gonna get irritated. But first the first heart stop you get, move on right away. Don't even give it any energy. But continue on and touch back with it later at least one time. If not, then just, and, and also don't judge them for not forgiving. It's a huge, you know, you just say, I get it, I totally understand, but, you know, let's, let's, let's continue to pray on this. And it's kind of so what a great point. If only we had written that into the script. <laughs> <laughs> you could have seen it work out. Either. But uh, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here's the thing, too, that I would say, that um, when, when you hear that, I, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I don't, because we ask the question a lot, or often we can ask the question, does that resonate with you? Mm -hmm. You know, here's what, you know, here's what I'm seeing or hearing you talk about. Does that resonate with you? And because, because you're giving it back to them to be in control, always them in control. Because otherwise, we're imposing our will onto them. Yeah. And that, that's getting into an inappropriate authority that's just getting into, you know, you need to do this. You need to do this or you're going to feel so much better. Really? Are they going to really feel so much better? Because they're not, they're, they're not there. They're not there to do it. So all, the, all we're going to really do is to shut them down. They're going, to, they're going to probably leave us at some point because it's just like everybody else. I'm, you know, Somebody's just telling me I'm not good enough. I'm not Christian enough. I don't have enough faith. I mean, whatever those things are. <clears throat> that they're going to be looking for evidence to support that lie, <laughs> and we're and so we just really don't want to touch on that. What we want to do instead is to listen for an opportunity to go back in. And so when he said, when I asked the question, "How are you feeling?" at one point after he had done some more forgiving, and he said, "I you know I feel relieved. I can't believe uh, I had all that much stuff." And but then he says, "And but if I'm being honest, I still feel a little angry because sometimes you." that you can see that there's still an angst there or there's still something that's still stirring and so we can ask them so what's that about what is that about and let them say what it is well I'm still feeling angry I'm still feeling you know okay well so let's talk about that then. and so however you want to talk to them about that to ask them those questions well here's a place that you also talked about feeling angry because remember we're looking for the root we're not yet looking, at this point, not necessarily looking for where that started, but what we're looking for is what are those patterns that we see again and again, what we're hearing again and again, and because there's touch points on that. And if they can start seeing the pattern, then they can start saying, that's where God can reveal it to them, like, oh my gosh, without feeling condemned. I love what you said about not judging them. Because if we can just say, you know what, same thing happened to me. I mean, you know, I mean, if we just have that attitude, yep, yeah, been there, done that, probably doing it tomorrow. Because <laughs> there's more there, you know. And the thing is, is that that's why, that's what we are to do, is just to help them get into that safe place where they can really look at their crap mm -hmm. and their hurt mm -hmm. and just say, you know what, I don't know why I feel this way, but I know I do. I know I do. And, and then we can go back in and say, well, you know that place where you, you know, when you pushed back a while ago and you said, I just don't feel like I can forgive that? Well, here's how that might possibly be playing out. Does one, that resonate with you? One of the things that I do is, I don't know, you have to really choose your words carefully, but if somebody is in a place, and it's very, it's, it may be the wrong place in terms of maybe it's for example unforgiveness or whatever. I and they and they know it's wrong and they're struggling with it. It's easy for them to feel, even if you're not saying anything, for them to feel judged, to feel worthless, like I'm doing the wrong. I know I'm wrong, I'm so screwed up, so broken. I let them know without giving without condoning where they're at, I said, I understand why you're there. You know what I mean? If I and I just say if I experience what you experience. I feel the same way you do. I'm going to be honest with you. And so you're not condoning it. You're just going, 
I get it. And it's like, this is where you are now because of your situation. <clears throat> but you don't have to be there. You know what I mean? Again, it's, it's got to choose your words carefully. I'm not saying, yeah, it's okay. You know? But it's just saying, I understand why you are here. You know, Given what you've experienced, I also would not have a lot of anger. I wouldn't want to forgive. However, blah, 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 you know. What else? What other ones do you have, Debbie? three or four instances through it where Sheila, for lack of a better word, nurtured him. Mm -hmm. yes. Rather it was rather it was, oh thank you for sharing that. I know that or or you've done great work here or, or how are you feeling? So yeah, that was something I noticed the it's way just not that exactly. it's like turn it back around and do it again. Yeah. There's something that's kind of occurring more in our conversation we're talking about in different views is um, we are, it's easy to focus on the problem and on the brokenness. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're geared to do. Where's the problem? Let's get the healing in there. It's, I think, just as important to speak God's truth in addition to that. You know, It's not just like, let's get rid of the bad stuff. What is the truth in this situation? You know, How does God feel about you? And that was really good, too. Cause, I mean, I felt that on a personal level where I was like, that was something that, because when, when you're, as a person seeking ministry, when you're talking about nothing but all the different ways you're screwed up, and if you hear it that way, it's easy to, like I said, when you're going through all this healing, to still feel like, God, I just, there's so much, I'm so, there's so many things that I've just let rule my life, you know. It's really important to give them context of how good this is, you know. You've just made, you know, you've just changed. I, you, you'd be sitting there going, here I am condemning and judging my father for the way he treated me, and I treat my kid just the same way. Why? Well, well, well. And I could easily just be like, I'm just hopeless, right? But then when you speak in that the choice you just made actually just changed the generation of your family, and that is ultimately what a father is to do. Think about how your grandkids, you're talking about your grandkids, you know, I'm just like, Kids, your grandkids, or whatever. It's like you just did that. That's what a great father does. To point that out, because it's easy to get lost on things. You're just thinking, hey, we just got to get through this, you know. But to speak that, all of a sudden, it's that's that's what you know. It's not just about healing. It, that, that part of the healing is to hear the truth of what God says about it. See, that was really powerful. You know? And it gives encouragement, maybe to go back to that anger issue too. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> it's just a procedural question. When you're breaking generational sin, do you have to go back for other generations? Or can you just go going back is beautiful, go forward. But is it is it I mean I don't think you've read like back through and forward this many. Is there a hard set rule or is it based on something here?
answers questions, surprises.